Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. I'm Dave Ross. I'm a WordPress plugin developer, a core contributor, and I'm one of the senior web engineers at 10UP. And they did it to me again. They gave me the last slot in the afternoon schedule. I think they did this at the last WordCamp I spoke at, too. And I have a couple theories. Either they think my deep, resonant voice is going to lull you all to sleep so you can be well-rested for the closing remarks and the after-party, or they think I'm going to wake you up, get you really excited about what I'm talking about, so you're going to skip the after party, go straight home and try all this out. And I'm hoping that's what they had in mind. My talk today is on Docker and Doku, two technologies that I think are going to have a huge impact on how we deploy websites and web applications like WordPress. This really is the future, and I can't wait to share it with you. But first I want to talk to you about the past. This is Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. In the late 1960s, they worked for AT&T Bell Labs, and they were assigned to a project called Multix. It was a collaboration between AT&T, MIT, and the federal government to build a multi-user time-sharing operating system. This was the holy grail back then. But as you can imagine, when you have a big company like AT&T, a bunch of Ivy League academics, and the government involved, things spiraled out of control. It was an academically beautiful operating system but it required a lot of computing resources to run. Thompson and Ritchie weren't happy about this, so they went back to their lab and built Unix. Back then, they were working on, I don't even think it was a PDP-8, I think they had a PDP-7, and they built an operating system that let multiple people log into the same machine and share its resources. And this was a big deal back then. The machine in the picture here, that's a really tricked out PDP-11. That computer probably cost tens of thousands of dollars in 1970s money. Just imagine what the equivalent would cost now. And Unix let them share the resources of this computer with an entire department of people. You have to remember, these are the days when a company would have one, maybe two computers, right? Today, a big company probably has more laptops and desktops floating around than they know how to track. But back then, you had the computer. People actually called it that, the computer. So it was important that people could share that investment. And you can bet they took really good care of that machine. Ten years ago, I worked for a large e-commerce company. And in the summer, I'd sneak down to, to work in the data center because it was air-conditioned, and I knew nobody was going to bug me. And in that data center, we had these five racks of Sun servers. I think they were V240s. They're beautiful machines. You look at the level of industrial design we expect from Apple's consumer electronics, and that's what Sun was doing with servers back in the 90s and early 2000s. And we had a book on top of one of the server racks. It was a book of Greek and Roman mythology, and we used them interchangeably. But every one of the servers in those racks had a name. There was Zeus, and Hera, and Eros, and Mars. And each machine had its own maintenance schedule, and a team of people responsible for taking care of it. There's been a discussion going on in the DevOps community for the past couple of years about the difference between servers as pets and servers as livestock. How many of you have pets? Maybe a cat, dog, bird, snake, something? You, you bring this animal into your home, and the first thing you do is you give it a name, right? My mom used to have a bird named Bird, but at least it had a name. And you take good care of these animals. You buy them really good food, like science diet. You take them to the vet for preventative care. You might let them sleep in bed with you. One of our cats actually has her own seat at the dinner table, and she sits there waiting for us to give her pieces of cheese while we eat. And the other cats are jealous because she gets to sit at the table like a person. It's like something on an animal farm. But a cow that's part of a herd, it's, it's one head out of a thousand. It probably has a number, not a name. It probably doesn't get to much preventative care. It doesn't get science diet. It becomes science diet. And it certainly doesn't get to sleep in bed with you. And that's kind of where we're going with servers these days. Today you can spin up a virtual server in under a minute. You can destroy it just as easily. And it costs less than a penny an hour to run one of these servers. We don't have hour-long meetings to pick a name for the new server. We just give it a number. When you're creating and destroying servers all the time like that, you need an easy way to deploy applications. A lot of times, this is done with virtual machines. You bundle up a virtual machine image and deploy it to one or more servers. Here's a typical VM-based server setup. You have your server. It's running a base OS, probably Debian or Ubuntu or something. And it's running a hypervisor, like VMware or KVM. And then you have your virtual machines on top of it. 
Each of these virtual machines is running its own OS, and then your binaries and libraries are installed on top of it. Each of these virtual, each of these virtual machines may be running its own copy of Nginx, MySQL, and Memcache. It's redundant. It's a waste of resources. Containers simplify things by letting your application run right on the base operating system without needing to include their own. They're able to share libraries and binaries, like Nginx and MySQL, but the applications run inside their own isolated environments, like VMs, so they can't touch the resources allocated to the other applications. Docker is a platform for hosting containers. It's fairly new, a little over a year old, I think, and it takes advantage of features that have been added to the Linux kernel in recent years, things like cgroups and namespaces that allow you to isolate things like processes, users, memory, and network interfaces, so they're not even able to look at what else is running on the same machine. LXC is a standardized way, standardized way of building and running containers, and on top of it, Docker adds tools for managing container images and hosting them in repositories. There's a public repository at docker.io, and you can host your own private repo or use a service like quay.io, and they provide tools for working with containers. Docker leverages a thing called a union file system, which we'll talk about in the next slide, and it has an outstanding community. It may not be as big as the WordPress community, then again, we have a 10-year head start, but they're just as passionate about their platform. If you've ever used a Linux Live CD, you know how you're able to download and create files even though the operating system is running off a of read-only media, right? It's using a union file system. It's a bunch of layers, and each layer is able to see the layer beneath it. But it's only able to write to its own layer. So inside a container, an app may think it's writing to the Nginx configuration, but it's only affecting the files in its own little world. How many of you have heard of Heroku? How many have used it? Heroku is big among developers, especially in the Ruby community. It's a platform as a service. It's based on the same LXC containers as Docker but abstracts them away into something they call dynos. A dyno is basically a single LXC container, and they take care of deploying your code to it. Deploying code to Heroku is as easy as adding a remote repository to your Git checkout and pushing code to it. Heroku uses these things called build packs, which are open source. They're not really descriptions. They're actually applications on their own. The build packs analyze your code and try to figure out if it's something they know how to deploy. And if it is, they set up an environment optimized for running an application like yours. Scaling Heroku is really easy. There's a slider on the website. If you think you're going to be getting a lot of traffic, you move the slider to the right and go from one dyno to two, five, ten. And when the crisis is over and you want to scale back down, you move the slider to the left and go back to just having one or two dynos. And they take care of creating and destroying these servers for you, deploying your code, all that. One thing they do, and this is really smart, they make your first dyno free. That means hobby projects and startups can get free hosting. But when they hit it big and maybe start making a profit, they're able to add a second dyno for $34.50 a month. That sounds like a lot, but you have to remember they may have been hosting your app for free for a while, and you're helping to subsidize a bunch of people just starting out. So I don't want to rip on them. This is really a great deal. But I like my $5 a month VPS. Which brings me to Daku. This project describes itself as a Docker-powered mini Heroku and about 100 lines of bash. They're really proud of their 100 lines of bash. You can see it on GitHub. It really is written in bash. And they really have a minimal aesthetic. They don't have a fancy website. They don't even have a logo. So most of us just use a picture of Christopher Lee. Daku is a self-hosted platform as a service. Its platform is a service without the service. It uses LXC containers. It runs on a $5 a month hosting account. It uses the same Git-based deploys as Heroku and the same open source build packs. And this is my favorite part. Containers run in a read-only file system by default. So if you don't do anything, if you don't punch any holes in the default security, nobody is going to be able to upload any malicious scripts or anything to your site. And they're definitely not going to be touching any of the other applications on your server. So some people use plugins like WP Read Only that lets you run WordPress on a read-only file system and upload your images to Amazon S3. And that's one option. Or you can make certain parts of your file system writable, like just WP content. Whatever you're comfortable with. Whatever trade-offs you're willing to make. 
The real power of Daku comes from plugins you add to it. These are additional scripts, also written in Bash, that extend Daku's capabilities. There's a plugin for MariahDB, a fork of MySQL. It runs, in a, it runs the database inside its own container, and the only way you can talk to that database is through a TCP IP port. None of your applications can even see the database process or any of its files. It's completely isolated. The link plugin lets you connect two or more containers, like your application and the database. It allows one container to set environment variables in another. You can use it for service discovery, so you don't need to hard code the database credentials in your WP config file. The database can tell WordPress how to connect. The domains plugin lets you map a domain name to your site. Docker parameters lets you pass parameters to the underlying Docker infrastructure, so you can do things like mounting parts of the host file system inside your container. I do this for my themes, plugins, and uploads. I write them to a place in the file system and back them up to a different server every night. And as far as WordPress is concerned, that directory is just part of its container, and it can't see anything outside of it. There's even a memcached plugin that runs memcache inside of its own container. And there's a whole bunch more. It's a small but active community. So are you ready for a demo? Good, I'll release that as a separate video. Thanks for watching. The slides for this, along with this video and any others I put together, will be hosted at uh, davidmichaelross.com. There's a section on the bottom of the front page for uh, presentations I've done. Uh, be sure to check that out. Follow me on Twitter, at C64. Learn more about WordPress, uh, software development in general, spoiled cats, shelter cats, and uh, some computer history. Be sure to visit the fantastic new 10up.com. My coworkers worked really hard on this. We got it out the door last month. It's a great showcase of everything our team is capable of. Check it out. See the kind of work we've done. If you'd like to hire us, there's a, bottom, there's a button on the bottom of the website to, to hire us for your project. If you'd like to work with us and be part of the team creating these awesome projects, there's another button right next to it. Do you run? Are you a runner, jogger? Check out WPRunners.org. It's a virtual running club for WordPress uh, developers, users, enthusiasts, uh, just people who like to get up and move and who use WordPress. Right now there's two people, so it's not much of a club. We'd love to have you join us. And be sure to come to the uh, WordCamp Philly Dev Day. It should be exciting. Learn how you can contribute to WordPress itself. And I guess since this is a video going up on YouTube, I should say, uh, whatever WordCamp you're going to, first of all, go to WordCamps. Uh, but when you go to one, there's usually some kind of developer day, some kind of community contributor day. Go to that. It's a lot of fun, and you'll find out it's, it's not just a bunch of programmers in a room. It's a great opportunity for everyone to learn how they can get involved with WordPress, however they're capable of or comfortable with. And it's great. The community is what makes WordPress what it is. And I'm really excited to be part of this project. So thank you for your time. Be sure to keep a lookout for further videos in which I demonstrate setting up and running a uh, Docker system. And thanks for watching.